Good morning and welcome to Rock Crusher Road Church. It is a true joy and privilege to be joining with you this morning as we set aside this time to focus on what God desires to say to us today. And so we encourage you to enter into this time with us, shun all of the distractions that you might have so that we can spend this time seeking the presence of God together today. And one of the things that we encourage you to do to follow along with us is to pick up a journal. Uh, You might not have a journal like this. You may have picked one up here at the church. But on our Facebook page and on our website, you can find a digital copy of this journal. This morning, we'll begin a new series and taking a look at Paul's writings as he was bound in Roman custody in chains of what it is he's saying from the book of Philippians to us. And so in this journal are some ways that you can follow along, take a look at the scripture, and review what Paul is writing. And so we encourage if you don't have one of these, pick up one of these and you can find that on our Facebook page or also on our website. Another thing we want to ask if you would prayerfully consider enter into a partnership with us here at Rock Crusher Road Church and supporting the ministries and all that we are doing in this community and supporting missionaries around the world as other state ministries as well in spreading the good news of the gospel. And so on your screen this morning are three ways that you can give in supporting Rock Crusher Road Church in the ministries. And so you can give by mail, on our website, or by text. We're just asking you to prayerfully consider if this is what the Lord would have you to do. Also this morning, we just want to ask that you, if you would, just take just a moment, wherever you're gathering, in your living room, your bedroom, in your car, the garage, uh, in your front lawn, wherever you might be this morning, take just a few moments and get rid of any distractions around you so that you can prepare your heart and prepare your mind to experience the presence of God because we believe that he has chosen to gather with us and to speak to us this morning. And so would you begin by praying with me? Father, we just pause to begin this worship this morning, this time of worship this morning, in prayer and focusing our hearts on you. And so we pause to welcome you into this place. We pause and ask that you would begin right now to prepare our hearts, to prepare our minds to the things, to the, to the things that you desire to say to us today. Lord, we just ask that as we enter into a singing together, and as we enter into opening up the Bible and studying your word that you have given to us as a tool to lead us closer to you, that you would clearly speak, and we as your sheep, as your children, would clearly know your voice. And so, Father, I just pray and ask at this time, prepare us right now. We yield this space and this time together with you and yield it. uh, uh, We yield this space, Father, and give it solely to you. And we just ask that above all things here today, that you would be lifted up and you would be glorified. And Lord, you have promised us in your word, and we claim this promise this morning. As we lift you up, you will draw us closer to you. So, Father, we just worship you. We lift you up and we proclaim the the beauty, the the splendor. We, We proclaim the majesty of your name. And we ask all of this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. Why don't you stand and sing with us as we sing, I will follow you, Lord. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my trust in you alone. When you go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If it's like 
to my life I will live for you alone you're the one I see knowing I will find all I need in you alone in you alone when you go I'll go when you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you whom you love I'll love in this life I live, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. In you there's life everlasting, in you there's freedom for my soul, in you there's joy unending.
between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free.
I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, if you would just uh, open it over to the book of Philippians this morning. We're going to take a look as we begin a new series in the book of Philippians of Paul, one of Paul's prison letters where he was um, being held, uh, although not in what we would think is a prison today, he was actually being held in a house that he was able to rent, but actually in chains to a Roman prison guard. And in this, what is it that Paul is saying? And it's important, I think, now for us to take a look of how we can experience what Paul is writing to us about despite what our circumstances are. And so Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to get this morning. But before we uh, get there, I want to put a scripture up on your screen for you so you can take a look at this. Because uh, I think before we look at the life of Paul and what he is sharing with us, we should probably take a look at the life of Jesus. We celebrated the, the death and resurrection of Jesus to conquer sin and to conquer the consequences of sin, which was death last week. And this week, let's look at Jesus and then let's look at the Apostle Paul. So in John chapter 15, verse 11, these are Jesus's words as John actually recorded them. He said, these things, Jesus, these things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now think about where Jesus was at here in John chapter 15. He knew that just before him, in a very short period of time, was the pain and the suffering that would, that would bring into his life the consequences of everybody else's sin. Jesus knew when he's saying, I've spoken all of, the, all of my ministry to you, all of about three and a half years, I've spoken to you so that my joy that I have, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to brutally die for your sins. But he says, I want my joy to be inside of you. Jesus knew full well what he was to be facing soon. And so what we see here in Jesus, when John records his words in John chapter 15, what we see here in Jesus is a true abiding joy, a joy that will carry us despite whatever circumstances that might be in our life. And I'll tell you that this is extremely important for us right now. As for about a month now, we've been going through the fight of coronavirus We've been isolated. We're socially distancing. There have been countless millions of people in our country that have lost their jobs, businesses that have closed that will never reopen. And what we are facing is a society, a culture that will never, ever be the same. What Jesus is saying to us is despite whatever circumstance that you may be going through right now, I have spoken these things to you, Jesus, while he was here, so that his joy would be in us, and so that that joy may be full. And I think that those are some interesting words, and very, very relevant words for us right now on April 19th of 2020. Jesus is saying, if you're lacking joy this morning... If you're caught up in circumstances, if you're caught up in the junk of life, if you're caught up in this mess that our country has been going through right now, and our political leaders are fighting and bickering, and some want this, and some want this, and some say they're doing a great job, and others are not doing a great job, and the people we once loved are the people we now hate, and the people we once hated now are the people that we love, and we're we're caught up in all of this mess where everything has been turned upside down. Jesus is saying, pause on all of that for just a moment, and listen to my words. Listen to my words, Jesus would say. I have spoken these things to you so that my joy, my joy can be in you. And so that joy could be completely full. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrew tells us that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. That same joy that Jesus had is the joy that he wants us to experience. And the writer of Hebrew is reminding us that all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the hurt, and all of the heartache that Jesus was going through 
in the midst of that, he had joy. You know, maybe even before this last month that we've had our world turned upside down, there were some drainers of joy, some joy robbers in your life. And maybe you had just got to a place where you were just going through motions in life. Get up and go to work, come home, go to bed, and get up and do it the next day and hope that you just have enough strength and you just have enough energy. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to live like that. Jesus is saying, I truly want you to experience my joy. And so that my joy may be full in you. So we fast forward a few decades after Jesus had already ascended back to heaven. And here the Apostle Paul, who actually had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, is now turned and has become an evangelist, an apostle for the church. And he's going everywhere planting churches. But yet, because of the persecution that he has found, or that, has faced, that he has faced, I mean, He's now sitting in a jail in Rome because some Jews had risen up against him and the word had gotten ahead of him of where Paul's life used to be. And some people felt that he was was tricking everybody and some people felt that he was being deceptive and he wasn't being honest and preaching the good news of the gospel. But here, for whatever, whatever those circumstances are, Paul is sitting in a jail. Paul is chained to a Roman soldier. And he had been here for, some would say, about two years. Two years at this point. Paul was in social isolation. He was socially distant from other people. He was able to receive people, but not a lot of people would make that trip to to visit with him. Some would, but not a lot of people would make that trip to visit with him. He was able to receive visitors, but in the midst of being chained for some two years, 24 months, 104 weeks, Paul writes about experiencing joy. He talks about experiencing rejoicing 18 times in just four, cha- four short chapters in the book of Philippians. For some of us, we can't begin to comprehend what Paul is talking about. After being chained for almost two years, he's writing about joy, and he's writing about rejoicing. But yet for a month, we've experienced just pure chaos in our life. And for some of us, that has depleted us completely of our joy. Some, we've worried about things that we've lost, things we may never gain back. We've experienced the pain. We've experienced frustration. We've experienced heartache. And we've allowed some of those small things to rob us of our joy. What, what, what is it that you are facing in your life today? Right here, right here on April 19th, 2020. What is it that you are facing that has attempted or may be robbing or stealing your joy? Why is it that we are so dependent sometimes on our circumstances to be on an emotional high and then we go on this emotional roller coaster and when circumstances are dark and gloomy, we find ourselves down here in the pit We go up and down like a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. And Jesus is saying, I want you to stop with all of that. And I want you to truly experience my joy and that it would be full. I'll tell you, the, the, the answer of why we do that is because we fill ourselves up with the wrong fuel. We pump into our tank spiritually and emotionally the wrong fuel. Now, if sin is there, that's a whole different issue. That sin is the number one joy robber in our, in our life. But despite that, if we, I mean, um, other than that, absent of sin, whenever we are on this roller coaster or this yo-yo, what steals us of our joy is the things that we filled ourselves up that we try to fuel our lives with. So, Let me try to best illustrate this, the the, the best way that I know how. Let's say that we were to go back a few years, a few decades now, um, and we were to get a car that ran on leaded gas. Some of you may be too young to remember uh, cars that actually drove on leaded gas, but at one time that was the case. There was leaded and there was unleaded 
And in leaded gas cars, you had to put in leaded fuel. And if you put the wrong fuel in a leaded gas car, eventually what's going to happen is that engine is going to seize up. So let's say that I've got a leaded gas car, and I put unleaded gas in the car, and I drove around for a little while on unleaded gas. I would probably, they, they say, I would probably go through a few tanks of fuel before the motor would start knocking, and eventually it would seize up. It would still go. The car would still go on unleaded fuel, despite needing leaded fuel. It would still go for a few tanks, but eventually it's going to start knocking, and it will get worse and worse and worse until finally the engine has a breakdown and it stops. But let's say I sped it up just a little bit, and I took this car that had leaded gas, and I put diesel fuel in it. They say that if you put diesel fuel in it, you may be able to get a tank or half a tank, depending, and eventually what will happen after a very short period of time, the diesel fuel is going to cause the engine of the leaded car to seize up. But let's say we went another step further and we accelerated the engine breaking down. And let's say we put sugar water in the tank of the car that takes leaded fuel. You're probably going to get a few miles down the road, and then the engine's going to knock and completely have a breakdown. You see, if you put the wrong fuel in a vehicle, it's going to eventually stop running, depending on what type of fuel you put in there. And we forget that our bodies are a lot like our vehicles. We need to be fueled up. And God has designed us to run on one type of fuel. And when you are running absent of Jesus Christ and his presence in your life, you're running on the wrong type of fuel. And eventually depending on what you're putting into you, you are going to have a breakdown. And Jesus is telling us the type of fuel that we need to experience the fullness of joy. What type of fuel have you been running on? What is the fuel that you have put, been putting inside of your body that you are depending on every single day to have the energy you need to face what you have to face. Fast forward over to the book of Philippians. And Paul is telling us that he's running on that same type of fuel that Jesus was talking about. Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, he says... I'll start in verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for you, all of you, with the affection of Christ Jesus. And then take a look at verse 12 through 14. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served, and listen, to advance the gospel. He's in chains. He's chained to a Roman soldier for about two years. And Paul is not saying here, what has happened to me has almost led me to a breakdown. No, he, that, that's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, what has happened to me, I'm facing with the joy that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 15, verse 11. He goes on to say in verse 13, as a result... It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Here's what we know about this world. And where we are at right now in this world, there are two types of people. There are complainers and there are worshipers. Listen, listen to that. There are complainers and there are worshipers. There are no other people other than that. That's it. And you either fall into one of those two categories at all moments in your life. You're either a complainer or you are a worshiper. The complainers can always find something to complain about. The complainers are the ones that will nitpick you. You could have just been given a million dollars. But the complainer is going to complain about the amount of taxes that you have to pay on that million dollars. You're a complainer or you're a worshiper. And worshipers, on the other hand, can always find something to praise God about. Always. You give a worshiper a million dollars and they rejoice in the gift from the Lord. So which are you and which do you think are joy robbers? Was Jesus a complainer or a worshiper when he was talking about the joy being full despite facing the cross? Jesus was a worshiper, wasn't he? Is the Apostle Paul in riding in chains for some two years, chained to a Roman soldier, a complainer or a worshiper? He's a worshiper, isn't he? We read his words when he said, I thank God with joy for you. I'm in a season of thanksgiving despite being in chains. Oh, and because I am in chains, it's advanced the message of the gospel. You see, Paul is worshiping God for what God is doing with his chains. Are you a complainer? Or are you a worshiper? A worshiper makes a decision in his mind before he gets to a circumstance that he is going to look for something to praise God about even though he's in the direst of circumstances. Another passage of scripture that we could take a look at this morning to demonstrate what Paul, is, what Paul is telling us about, in Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and Silas in a prison cell in Philippi. And they're in this prison cell. And what, how they got there is Paul had cast out a demon from a fortune teller. The fortune teller's boss didn't like it. And so they wound up getting Paul and Silas arrested. And they were thrown into a dungeon prison cell. In Acts chapter 16, verse 22, this is, listen, listen, listen to what it says here. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. So, do you hear the circumstances that Paul and Silas are facing here? They were stripped and beaten with wooden rods because of the mob. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. And this was a dungeon prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So he took no chances, but put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. It's almost as though just in reading that, we can place ourselves in that inner dungeon with them. We can hear the circumstances that they're facing. But we, we know that we've had bad days. You may have had a bad month. You may have thought, man, 2020 is a year that I wish that I could push the reset button and we could just get a redo with 2020 all over again. You may have thought, I've got a bad this. I've got a bad home. I've got a bad marriage. I've got a bad family. I've got a bad job. I've got a bad, I've got a bad. I've, and it just goes on and on and on and on. But let me tell you something. You've never experienced a circumstance or a bad day or a bad anything the way that Paul and Silas were facing this bad here in Acts chapter 16. And the same goes with what Paul was facing in Philippians chapter 1. If I'm Paul, or if I'm Silas, 
And I'm at this place in Acts chapter 16. I am emotionally and physically and spiritually exhausted and spent. Their backs and their sides were bleeding. I'm sure that they could almost not even walk to move forward. They were probably aching and hurting all over. I've never had a mob form against me. But I'm guessing that these things would zap you completely. They would drain you emotionally, physically, spiritually. It doesn't get a lot worse than this. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, listen to this verse that's recorded for us. Acts 16, 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining about their circumstances. Is that what it... Is that, is, that what, is that what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 25 here? Uh-uh. It doesn't say that they were complaining about their circumstances. It doesn't say that they were complaining and licking their wounds. It doesn't say that they were arguing over what they were going to do when they got out of jail to get this mob back. That's not what verse 25 says in Acts chapter 16. Listen, this is what it says. Around midnight, Paul and Silas, and listen to this, they were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. They were worshiping God. You are a complainer or you are a worshiper. And Paul is saying to us today, and I want you to listen to this, you can either experience the joy that God has for you in worshiping God, or you can spend your life as a complainer and licking your wounds. But you can't take the two and bring them together. It doesn't happen. You're a complainer or you're a worshiper. In Acts 16.25, Paul is inviting us into praying and singing hymns to God. And when they did that, the other prisoners were listening to them. And I'm sure they joined in because they saw these guys that were spent in all points of their life. But yet they worshiped and praised God. God, when you are emotionally or spiritually or mentally or physically zapped, it is because you have put the wrong fuel in your body. And you are fixating, you are focusing, you are zooming in on what is wrong instead of the God that created you. So what kind of fuel have you been putting into your body? Is it the complaining? Oh, the governor announced yesterday there's not going to be any more school for the rest of the year. Is it, oh, I've lost this Or I've lost this. Or I can't get over this. Or there's this and this and this. Are you trying to to burn this fuel in your body? Or are you trying to burn in your spirit the fuel that comes from a most holy God? Are you burning the fuel inside of you spiritually and physically and emotionally and mentally? Are you burning the type of fuel that says, I have a God that will never forsake me. I have a God that is carrying me through these circumstances. What are you focusing on? What are you zooming in on? What fuel is it that you are burning right now? Is it the complaining stuff that we could have? And we've all got a lot of stuff to complain about. Or is that I am going to forget all of that and cast it aside and I am going to spend time worshiping God. Listen, sometimes you have to be like the Apostle Paul and Silas here in Acts chapter 16. Sometimes you have to be like the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 and you have to say, I'm going to zoom out of all of the junk in my life. I'm going to zoom out of all of the coronavirus stuff in my life. I'm going to zoom out from all the political mumbo jumbo in my life and I am going to not focus on that, but instead I'm going to focus on the God who created me and knit me together in my mother's womb. 
So let me tell you right quick here at the end of our service this morning, how do we zoom out? How do we get, forget about the junk? And how do we now focus on the bigger picture of what God is doing? There's one word, and it's not complaining. It is worshiping the God that loves you so much he died for you. Listen to me, people. Listen to me, friends. Listen to me, brother and sister. God created you to burn one fuel inside of you. And that is the fuel of worship. Because worship takes our eyes off all of the bad and it puts our eyes on the only thing that is always and will always be good. When we are focusing and zooming in on something, we're burning the wrong fuel. But when we step back and say, God, I'm going to fix my eyes on you. God, I'm going to look at you and you only, the only good that ever was and is and is to come. Listen, that's where God wants you to be today. That's what God has positioned you to now to get rid of the junk and to get rid of the the bad and, and quit focusing on that. It'll always be there. But we just choose not to focus on it. And instead, we choose to focus on the one, the only one, that we worship. Because worship restores the equilibrium in our life. Have you ever been dizzy and you've, you've just not been, a, been able to walk? I saw someone that was, was dizzy this week. And they weren't, weren't able to walk and they had to hold on to things. Their equilibrium was off. But listen, when you stop focusing on the bad and you start worshiping, and you start focusing on God, you regain your spiritual equilibrium that puts you in a place to be able to stand upright despite all the circumstances and to stand in the presence of God. It helps you to regain your perspective. It enables you to find something right to praise God about. Listen, I think it is no coincidence Absolutely no surprise to God that we are in the the midst of this coronavirus stuff. And we've just come from last week and celebrating his death, his burial, and his resurrection and ascension to God. Because I believe the first thing that you have to focus on in your life is the fact that Jesus died for you. Because all of the sin that brings the bad has to be crushed And Jesus came and died to crush and destroy sin, to break those chains that hold us down. And until that is broken, you cannot begin a life of worship. And so this morning, I ask you, listen to me. I I want you to catch this this morning because this is extremely important. Listen to me. You have to be in relationship with Jesus Christ first. Above all things, despite any other relationship you have, they take second chair to the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. And until you have that relationship first in your life, you will always lean toward the side of complaining. Paul and Silas, in the midst of their circumstances, about midnight, verse 25 says, they were praying and singing hymns to God and all the others were listening to them. They were bleeding down their sides where they had been beaten almost to death. They were bruised, they were hurting, but they weren't focusing on that. They were focusing on the God who died for them. Focusing on God restores your spiritual equilibrium. Worship is reframing your circumstances. Listen to that again. I want you to catch that. Worship is reframing your circumstances. What some of you need to do today is declare with your mouth so that the enemy hears you. Today... August 19th, 2020, I am reframing my circumstances. Let me tell you somebody that did that. On my way home, after doing a short-term missionary assignment in Athens, Greece, I stopped in the country of Holland, 
And I took a train and I rode out north of the airport and I wanted to visit the home of Corey Tinboom. Corey Tinboom and her family stood up for the Jews. And there in her father's watch shop that they lived in the couple of stories above that, taking a tour of the house, I got to see the hiding place in Corey and her sister's bedroom of where whenever the Nazi soldiers were alerted, the Jews would go into this false, behind this false wall in their closet to hide. A number of times they were able to escape, but this last time, a soldier looked out the window and saw that the house was longer than where the wall was. They eventually found the Jews, and they put the entire Tin Boom family in a concentration camp. Everything, everything that they had in a moment was taken away from them, from the prisoners. They were stripped of their clothing. They lost all of their personal belongings. They even took away their own names, their identities, and they gave them a number and never used their names, only the numbers. And this is what Corey Ten Boom said. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. Despite the beatings in the concentration camp, despite losing her family members, despite being stripped of everything they had, Corey Tinboom said, I'm not going to be a complainer. I'm going to look to God so that my soul will be at rest. This morning, friend, I want to invite you to a place of rest. This world can't give it to you. And listen, our political heads, our news cycle, you can't find rest there. We will only ever be able to find things to complain about there. I want to invite you in to experience this rest and to experience the joy that Jesus has for us that only comes when we begin in relationship with the God that died for us. Paul and Silas here in prison worshiping, praising God. They only did that because they were focusing on God and the relationship that they had with God. Paul writing in, in Philippians chapter 2, I'm sorry, in Philippians chapter 1, he's writing to us about being in chains for the sake of the gospel because of that relationship that he had with the God that loved him. Jesus saying to us in John chapter 15, 11, I am telling you all of this stuff so that my joy can be in you and so that joy will be full. It came because despite the cross, he was worshiping God. This morning, I want to invite you to renew your commitment in your relationship with God. Maybe you've never started a relationship with God. Maybe you've never been able to say, I'm in relationship with the God that died for me. This morning, I'm inviting you to just lay everything down to him and say, God, I want you to be my savior and I accept you and what you did for me because of the sin that's in my life. I want it, all of us this morning to renew our commitment. If you've been in relationship with God for 70 or 80 years in your life, this is the day that God is saying, I want you to choose. Are you going to be a complainer or are you going to be a worshiper? Today's a day of reckoning. Today's a day of choosing. So what are you going to choose this morning for all of us? Let's renew our commitment. Say, despite the circumstances, I'm turning my back on those circumstances and I am going to, to walk in relationship with God. Let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that you have for us. We thank you that you died despite the circumstances that you were facing. You went through with it. 
And you didn't have to, but you did because of your love for us. This morning, Father, I just pray and ask that for every single one of us this morning, that you would speak to us right where you're at, right where we're at this morning, wherever it might be. And that your Holy Spirit would draw us through conviction closer and closer to relationship with you. Father, this morning, I'm just praying for broken chains of circumstances. I'm just praying and crushing the works of the enemy this morning and the distractions that he would cause for us to say yes, but in our life. I'm praying, Lord, for the joy that you shared with us, the joy that Paul and Silas have shared with us in praising God and thanking you and worshiping you and singing to you would truly be in every single one of our lives this morning. God, this morning, let your Holy Spirit speak to us. God, this morning, renew in us that fire and hunger for relationship with you. And we ask all of these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender. Yeah.